thank you all for coming. Take your seats now. Um, give me two seconds. Roger's going to turn off the music. So um, again, my name is Michael McFall. I'm the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute, of which CDDRL, run by Frank and his colleagues, Larry and others, are a part of. Uh, we are thrilled to be here for GDPI launch, hashtag GDPI launch, if you want to tweet about it. And we are live streaming as well, so welcome to those of you who are online with us today. Uh, here at FSI, here at Stanford, here at CDDRL, uh, we for years now have been thinking, talking, discussing the relationship between digital technology, democracy, human rights, uh, economic development, and national security. That's, it's not a new topic here. In fact, we have a lot of, I think, some of the most talented people in the country here at Stanford and here today, of course, because you're all here, uh, working on this. Um, uh, my own view as a, you know, sometimes participant in this, as a policymaker, uh, sometimes a recipient of these activities. As you can well imagine, the Russians uh, do a lot of things with me and my email and my Twitter account and my Facebook account. Um, and as I listen to the debates in Washington here at Stanford in the Valley, it feels to me like this is a moment in time when technology has outpaced policy. The technology has moved faster and is more adept and keeps moving, by the way, every single day, whereas the norms, the policies, who should do what in this realm, especially with respect to democracy, but also with respect to security, I think are running behind. Um, and of course, we Americans uh, uh, experienced it, you foreigners witnessed it in 2016, what are the, the, the very complicated consequences of not having policy aligned with uh, technology, at least that's my view. Now, that's only one case, right, to put it in the language of political science. I'm also a political scientist. And over the course of the day, we're going to discuss many more instances of this. Uh, but I do think it's a pretty big, important case. Uh, and that's why I'm delighted that we have somebody with some special knowledge about it speaking later today uh, to end our conference. Um, we already have, as I said, lots of activities underway here at FSI and CDDRL. And across the campus, I also co-chair the Stanford Cyber Initiative, where our focus is on security, governance, and the future of work. And what I would say is, you know, if you're not from Stanford, become acquainted with all the activities. Go to our websites. Go to our, our brand new website of GDPI. Um, uh, we're doing a lot. But we're not very coordinated. Uh, we're pretty decentralized. Uh, and in particular, I would say that the bridge between theory, research, and policy is weak, very weak. And when I say bridge to policy, I think of different domains. I don't just think of the White House and the US government, although that's a very important one, but the bridge between us and ideas and research and the US government, the Chinese government, the Russian government is weak. The bridge between us and the Valley is weak. The bridge between us and multilateral institutions and international organizations is weak. And we need to build those in a stronger way. And that's why I am thrilled that Ambassador Donahoe is doing exactly just that. She came to us with this idea. Uh, it was, took me about 30 seconds to decide that this is a really important thing that we should do at Stanford. And now you are at the inaugural event, which I hope will be many, many more over the years to come, precisely to, to bridge that gap. Now, Eileen, as many in this room know, is already doing that in all of her work, both while she was in the government and her non-governmental work. That's why she's the perfect person, together with Larry Diamond, because we want research and policy to be wedded, wedded's the wrong word, uh, connected closely um, uh, so that we can do that, that work that I just described most uh, effectively. And so the mission of GDPI to inspire policy and governance innovations that reinforce democratic values, universal human rights, and the rule of law in the digital realm is exactly what Stanford should do, is exactly what CDDRL should do, what FSI should do, and frankly, everybody in this room who cares about these issues. So uh, again, thank you, Ambassador Donahoe. Thank you, Larry Diamond. Uh, hashtag GDPI launch for those of you who want to tweet. I was asked to say that right at the end again. I have done so, and without further ado, Ambassador Dinahome.
Thank you. I want to start with thanks. Thank you all for being here. I'm very happy the day has arrived. Uh, and I want to start by thanking Mike, um, actually, for responding so quickly and just making it happen when we had that first conversation. I think that day we actually talked about the overlap between uh, CDDRL and CSAC and how the issues at stake here really break down those silos. So thank you. I also want to thank Frank Fukuyama, the Mossbacher Director of the Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, who has taken me in there, and that's the home for the Global Digital Policy Incubator. Especially need to thank Larry Diamond, who is my partner in crime here, and um, I completely lucked out with Larry. He literally may be the best person at Stanford to work with. Um, he's not only brilliant, he is beloved by students for good reason, and he has been a great role model for me. So he has been amazing. So many people to thank um, who put this together, Neil, Scott, Georgia, Serena, Cheney, Roger, Elaine Eno, so many people. But special shout out for two very important people. Uh, Sarah E. Zaldambidi has become my absolute lifesaver. I think she is not even in this room because of course she's working. That's what she does so well. She is amazing. Uh, and Mary Ellen Horwath has also completely saved my life here and stepped up to the plate. So big thank you. They are the ones who made this happen. We also need to thank the Knight Foundation for providing support for this event, um, and, but especially for making a big commitment to invest in the community of scholars at Stanford. Uh, working at the intersection of democracy and digital technology. We are all very appreciative of this support and their vision in uh, supporting people at Stanford. Uh, last, I need to thank the amazing speakers on our list, especially those who've come from outside of Stanford to travel here to be today, and also in the case of Daphne, who w was willing not to travel to stay here for today. Your expertise um, is what make, will make this pro project unique. I need to take a minute to say a couple of words about the Global Digital Policy Incubator. Um, our vision at the start of this was to create a collaboration hub at Stanford for the private sector, government actors, civil society members to address these big ethical and governance challenges that flow from digital technology and to develop practical policy ideas. Um, at the practical level, we all want society to reap the upside benefits of digital technology. But we must also protect citizens, consumers, civilians from the threats. Uh, we, in particular, at GDPI, recognize there is a lot of conceptual confusion about how to govern, and it's combining with fear of all the cyber threats that run through society. And even democratically inclined governments and well-intentioned private sector companies may be getting their policies wrong. That is the very real risk in the digital ecosystem, and that's what we're focused on. To say that digital technology has disrupted society is a cliche at this point. But I think we are only just starting to grasp how radical a break we are facing with respect to our institutions, our legal structures, and even articulation of our norms and values now that digital tools are running throughout society. At the most fundamental level, we do not know how to conceptualize our digital spaces. We do not know the difference between digital platforms and services. We don't know how to conceptualize the internet itself. Are they public spaces or private spaces? Public resources or privately owned re infrastructure? The answer to those conceptual questions will dictate some of the answers to the questions about who is responsible for governing, on what terms, and with what aims, and according to what values. I am holding on to the idea that we do have enduring values. But our past articulation of those values, as expressed in texts like the US Bill of Rights or the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, 
as well as our doctrine about how to apply those texts and values have been disrupted. And the core challenge is to figure out how to hold on to these enduring values but rearticulate them in our new context. To strike a balance, an optimal balance, between continuity and change from past articulations. And I think that is essentially what Tim Timothy Garton Nash's book, uh, Free Speech, 10 Principles for the Connected World, is all about. Uh, today's program is focused specifically on the digital information ecosystem. We have three panels. The first is moderated by Larry Diamond. I will let him describe what's in that. The lunch panel is moderated by Mike McFall about the growing national security threat from info ops and weaponization of information and the bizarre interplay between domestic and foreign actors seeking to undermine our democratic processes. The third panel is moderated by Larry Kramer, president of the Hewlett Foundation, who's the brains and resource behind the cyber initiative. And that, is a, that panel is about the emerging roles and responsibilities of the private sector. And finally, we have our final segment with Secretary Clinton. So thank you all for being here. We're looking forward an, to an exciting day and all of your engagement. Okay, we'll get started with the panel in a minute. Um, uh, I've just, I've got to thank Eileen, right? Um, uh, I really uh, have to say that uh, her extraordinary vision, energy, and depth of understanding of these issues uh, that we're going to wrestle with today <clears throat> has enabled us to convene here. Uh, a remarkable gathering of stakeholders, uh, analysts, practitioners of these issues from academia, from NGOs, from leading digital technology companies, uh, as well as a number of former government officials, uh, like Mike, for example, who've had to wrestle directly with these issues. I want to echo um, uh, Eileen's thanks both to Mike uh, and to our CDDRL director, Frank Fukuyama, who we will uh, hear, with, hear from soon. I also want to acknowledge um, our uh, Stanford colleague, uh, Nate Persily, who with Frank <clears throat> is one of the principals in an ambitious new project which has just been funded by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Uh, as well as the Stanford Cyber Initiative to study how the internet and social media are affecting democracy in the United States and around the world. We're pleased that GDPI is a participant in that project and, this, and that this conference today, all the activities today in fact, <clears throat> are the first activities to enjoy support from uh, this generous grant from the Knight Foundation. Uh, Eileen has thanked our staff. I want to say again, we're um, now kind of late in terms of time, but to all of you who've helped to make this uh, possible, <clears throat> we are deeply uh, appreciative. I wanted to say some words to put this in context. Um, I will condense uh, what I was going to say, and then I will add the longer version to the product that will result from this meeting. <laughs> But um, briefly, I will say, and I think it is important for us to bear in mind, look, I start as a democracy scholar more than as a scholar on technology and democracy. The latter I kind of backed into from the former. It's an increasingly dark time for freedom and democracy in the world. If you look at the Freedom House data on political rights and civil liberties, we're now in the 12th consecutive year of freedom receding in the world. For many years, I'd say most of the last 12 years, this was a fairly mild phenomenon, even a debatable one among academics who will debate almost anything. But in recent years, the trend uh, has accelerated, and I think it's now really unmistakable. Freedom is slipping in every category of regime in the world. Many of the world's most liberal and longest lasting democracies are facing gl growing illiberal pressures both in terms of freedom of expression and inclusion of minorities. The quality of democracy in these countries is shri shrinking as well under relentless polarizing pressures generated by globalization, rising inequality, intolerance, and the echo chamber effects of social media, which is part of what drives and informs the panel we're about to hear, 
And then you look at all the other categories, including uh, some of the countries that Tim has engaged in Central and Eastern Europe from his uh, earliest work. It's a sobering time. And all of this is inflicting a hard toll on internet freedom. So here is what Freedom House uh, reported in its latest Freedom on the Net report. Internet freedom declined globally in 2016 for the sixth consecutive year. Two thirds of all internet users now live in countries where criticism of rulers is subject to censorship. And social media users are facing uh, these days unprecedented penalties as authorities in 38 countries made arrests just based on what people posted on social media. These of course are not the only challenges we are facing to the health of the global digital sphere, but they speak to the urgency of the moment. If we don't identify in this digital age wise approaches to balancing democracy and freedom of expression, both will suffer grievously. So that brings us to our panel. Timothy Garton Nash is Professor of European Studies at Oxford University, Isaiah Berlin Professor Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Of course, Eileen has uh, recently referred to his seminal book, Free Speech, 10 Principles for a Connected World. Francis Fukuyama is, as we mentioned, Moss Bachter Director of CDDRL and Olivier Namalini Senior Fellow at FSI. And you know his work, but you may not know that he's finishing a new book on identity, which is deeply relevant to these issues and will be out, I think, pretty soon. Britton Heller is the first Director for Technology and Society of the Anti-Defamation League, uh, where she focuses on defending civil rights in the digital environment. And she also is coming from a distinguished career at the US Department of Justice and the International Criminal Court to investigate and prosecute war crimes and other grave human rights violations. Justine Isola is public policy manager at Facebook. She's a former journalist uh, who's worked on a wide range of uh, public policy issues for private sector companies as well. And Mike and Catherine Stoner will appreciate it if I say she is also an alumnus of the International Policy Studies program here. Finally, uh, Ieva Ilvis is on leave from the Ministry of Defense in Latvia, where she has headed the um, cybersecurity uh, policy operations there and been in charge of establishing the NATO Center of Excellence uh, on Strategic Communications. So with that, I'll now shift my location uh, and um, lead the discussion uh, for a few minutes. Uh, maybe half of our session before we open it up to your larger partic participation. I want to begin by just kind of mapping where we are now uh, in terms of the tension between freedom of expression and the quality or, if you will, civility of discourse um, that we need if we're going to sustain, well, I'd say a good liberal democracy, but maybe liberal democracy, period. Um, no one that I know of has thought about this more deeply uh, and creatively and with greater forthrightness than Timothy Garton Nash. So, uh, Tim, you've got a number of thoughts on this. So, uh, you know, try and distill them down to a few minutes for us. Thank you, Larry. Well, first of all, congratulations on what sounds like a terrific initiative, another great initiative in this area at Stanford. Um, I mean, as we all know, free speech is indispensable to democracy. Uh, Josiah Ober, a great scholar at this university, has demonstrated that it was present at the creation of ancient Athenian democracy. And by the way, by free speech, we mean at least three things. Freedom of expression, which is in our title, freedom of information, which is just as important, and a certain quality of democratic discourse or debate. There's something about the quality of the speech. Now, um, so as both Mike and, and, and Eileen said, it's a case of old principles in dramatically new circumstances. Now, I think the first thing to say is that the internet as a whole has been a fantastic gain for the kind of freedom of expression and information we need for democracy. That needs to be put out there. We have unprecedented access to information 
to evidence, to ideas from across the world. I love my Twitter feed. I think Pericles would have loved his Twitter feed. <laughs> <coughs> but, but, as always happens with technology, if there's a big upside, there's a big downside. That's true of all technology through history. It was true of printing, obviously. And thinking about the downsides, which we're now focusing on, Larry, since, since Larry set me up for this, um, like that Gilbert and Sullivan character, I have a little list. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to go through it at Gilbert and Sullivan operetta speed, but I, I think it's useful just to lay out a few headings. Okay, so I've actually got ten, and it's not complete. Number one, sheer quantity. That's the flip side of the positive. A um, lot of criticism of Facebook, some of it justified. How do you monitor billions of items of content coming up in 200 languages every day? So that's number one. Number two, if we believe that the state does have a legitimate role in regulation on, for example, extreme uh, paedophile child pornography or on terrorism, then the frontier hopping quality of the internet, information, ideas, images, sweeping across frontiers, makes that legitimate function of the state more difficult. Number three, democratic discourse requires a quality that I try and capture in the phrase robust civility. So it's not just civility. It's not just having tea with the queen. It's robust civility. There's nothing you can't talk about, but you talk about it in a civil way. It's what we try to do in universities. Now, the way the internet has developed produces a big challenge to this. It's partly because it's not face-to-face. -face. It's partly because much of it is unedited. It's partly because it's very quick. So people tweet and then think rather than the other way around. It's also because of anonymity. <coughs> There's very good work demonstrating that anonymity contributes greatly to incivility. Actually, if you write a Guardian column, you know that anyway, because you just <laughs> see the comments. Not just incivility, hate speech, harassment, cyberbullying, death threats. I've never forgotten a comment made to me by the Canadian liberal feminist Muslim thinker Irshad Manji who gets many, many death threats. And she said, Tim, the person who is usually threatening me with death is called anonymous. But at the same time, anonymity is essential for people living in dictatorships or oppressive communities. So we have a problem there. OK, number four follows from that, impersonation, which is slightly distinct. Impersonation. You think you are being addressed by a fellow American voter. In fact, you're being addressed by a Russian bot. We used to say, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog, and now we say, on the internet, no one knows you're a bot. Uh, and actually, the development of AI, the rapid development of AI, contributes enormously to this. I saw a paper the other day which envisaged a wonderful dystopian future in which the internet would mainly consist of billions of bots trying to persuade or sell things to other bots, <laughs> each thinking that the other was a human being, which I think is a rather wonderful, uh, hilarious dystopia. This leads on more seriously to number five, disinformation and misinformation, the subject of the next panel. Disinformation by which I mean false information maliciously disseminated for political reasons. By misinformation, I mean false information maliciously disseminated for other reasons, for example, money, Macedonian meme farms. Now, this is a big problem. It leads on to an even bigger one, which is there is good work that shows that misinformation, false information, is as likely to go viral as reliable information. That's pretty well established. So, and this is point number six, you have a balance between what I call virality and veracity. If you believe that veracity is a quality you need, in media, in for uh, well-informed citizenry, then if your algorithms privilege virality, you have a problem. So there's a question to the Facebook news feed algorithm. Number seven, mentioned already, homophily, echo chambers, filter bubbles. What I would just say quickly on this is, to emphasize again what Mike and Eileen said, we need much more research on this. It is not well established where and what exactly is the echo chamber effect. And for that, we need the data from Facebook. 
because otherwise we can't do the research. <laughs> uh, number eight um, follows from that. Impact on established media. The fact is the business model of most newspapers in the Western world has been blown out of the water. They're all struggling for survival. This means they do less serious investigative reporting, much less foreign reporting. They sensationalize, they shout in order to try and get the click stream. That's a serious problem for the quality of our democratic discourse. It goes to point number nine in the Gilbert and Sullivan list, mm. which is a very important one, only now becoming salient, the tendency to monopoly. There is a very clear tendency to monopoly because of network, network effects and other reasons on the internet. Intrinsically, <coughs> Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Apple, what the French call les GAFA, what I call the private superpowers, intrinsically, that is a potential danger for democracy. Any study of quality of democracy will have a criterion which is media pluralism. So if you don't have good media pluralism. Number 10, not quite so obvious, but I think important, is the erosion of online of privacy and the potential for mass surveillance. I say the potential, not necessarily the actuality, because even potential big brothers are a danger for democracy. OK, so that's my little list, Larry. It's not comprehensive. One might be tempted to say, looking at that, bloody hell. What a, <laughs> what a bloody, to no, use no stronger word, tsunami of bad stuff coming at democracy from the internet, isn't it going to engulf us? I would warn against mood swings from the extreme of cyber utopian optimism of the 1990s to the kind of cyber fatalism of today. Actually, what we have to do, we who believe in both free speech and democracy, is to keep working to maximize the positive, the upside, which is still very big, and minimize the downside. That, in the most general terms, is what we have to do. Last point, Larry, who is we in that sentence? We'll come back to this, I'm sure, in discussion. In my book, I talk about the big dogs, the big cats, and the mice. The big dogs are the states and their governments. The big cats are Facebook, Google, Twitter, Amazon, <laughs> Apple, what the French call les GAFA. I call them private superpowers, and the mice are us the citizens and netizens, <laughs> collected in smaller entities, in think tanks, in NGOs, in universities and civil society. And on each of these points that I've mentioned, and any others that will come up, the question I think we have to ask is, what do we want each of these three sets of actors, governments, companies and civil society, to do in what interaction with each other. I mean, I think that's the structure of the question on each point. Now, Larry, I have, as you know, some views on that, but I think in the name no, of we'll, robust we'll, civility, we'll, 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 I should come let back someone to else you. speak. <laughs> Since we've got uh, big, big dogs, big cats, and mice in the room here, I hope people don't call it a zoo. But in any case, um, uh, let's uh, move on now. Um, I think we will keep coming back to the scope and trends in terms of the issues that you have raised, <clears throat> uh, Tim, but I thank you for framing it in a very lucid way. Uh, part of what we want to do here is really kind of think hard, forthrightly and creatively about um, the responsibilities, uh, opportunities, and maybe imperatives confronting um, both the uh, uh, major private sector actors here, and the governments. Um, so I'd like to begin with the private sector roles uh, and responsibilities uh, with regard to a number of issues. First of all, aggregation and curation of news. How should they relate to the professional news media? And should they be? I think this is one of the questions everyone is wrestling with, somehow arbiters of truth, and who is to define that? Um, can we at least expect them to take responsibility for identifying what is obviously fabricated or patently untrue, or is that a slippery slope to uh, censorship? So before I come to Justine, who I know has to think about this in her role at Facebook, 
I do want to start with someone, I guess, who's trying to rally the mice here uh, in civil society, namely Britain in her role as um, Director for Technology and Society at the Anti-Defamation League. So go ahead. I like to think of myself as a very fierce mini mouse. Okay. So. <laughs> How about Mighty Mouse? Mighty Mouse, that's better. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the threats posed to democracy by specific types of online activity how this uniquely manifests in the Amer American political system, and how the most recent changes in, in our zeitgeist have moved the needle on company responses. In my role at ADL, I serve as a resource to tech companies. And this has been more pronounced since the, um, the marches and the activity, the violent activity in Charlottesville. Um, it's, it's three to four consultations per week at this point. And I can't speak to the specific inside baseball of these companies, so I also have a list for you of the, the type of maladies that these companies are looking at and are, are seeing come up again and again as threats to democracy. The work that I do is at the intersection of civil rights and technology. And so this means that it has to be both private and public facing in these efforts with the tech industry. It encompasses law, policy, and emergent technologies. It requires working with the companies and really accommodating their business models and their underlying philosophies in order to identify leverage points for change and applying advocacy tools to alter internet ecosystems and create real social change. A lot of this is predicated on the concept of dang dangerous speech. And when you're balancing free speech, freedom of expression, and public safety. This concept comes to mind because it's catalyzing speech. It's speech that has a potential to, to break into violence and to move mass populations towards that end. And so in that way, my background in atrocities prevention and international criminal law marries very well with, with the new challenges that we're facing today. So the five threats to democracy that we see from online activity often occur in concert with each other. So the distinctions are a little bit artificial. For, and, and some of these you've touched on already, so I'll, I'll just move through them quickly. Um, first is computational propaganda or the fake news. And like you were saying, I use the term computational propaganda because it's not new. You've seen propaganda before. We've seen it throughout history being used to influence populations and change their political attitudes and really mobilize populations. What is new here is use of new technologies like bots to, to shape public opinion and resulting in social effects like these trending topics in the media or inflamed social tensions. And second is information operations. And these are state-sponsored campaigns to destabilize political systems. And again, this is analog to a pre-digital functionality, but it's now enhanced by the ability to use micro-targeting to identify pre-primed audiences and specifically tailored ideas to seed to these really receptive people. Third is hate speech and cyberbullying. And I don't just mean people being nasty to each other on the internet. That's human nature, but this is something a little more malignant. Um, these, this is intimidation campaigns, and you often find these directed at journalists, minority populations, or political activists. And it's designed to dissuade these populations from participating in the public debate. Third is terrorist recruitment or online extremism. And so this is use or misuse of online communications to assemble groups and create inertia, which can often result in this real-world violence. And finally, our echo chambers. And so I've seen this defined as the channeling and concentration of like-minded points of view. And this results in a increasing polarization of options and misperceptions about where one's viewpoint is actually aligned in the political spectrum. So it shifts the center, or at least the perception of the center, to the speaker. I, I think that, that you and I woke up and, and had the same the same brainstorm this morning, because I, I agreed with you, uh, Timothy, when you were talking about how none of these maladies is new, but the mechanisms to deliver it 
in a targeted and systematic way to online audiences who view it with varying degrees of critical thought and skepticism, this is what is new. And this is what is threatening democracy today. Well, um, thank you for um, that beautiful distillation, Britain, and for the work you have done and are doing now at the Anti-Defamation League. And look, anyone who's followed the history of the Anti-Defamation League, which is a remarkable organization, it is certainly a testimony to our times that they now have uh, you know, a significant uh, you know, uh, representative based here in the Silicon Valley. All right, uh, Justine, I suspect you're not going to radically differ from the portrayal of the challenges, um, though if you do, please say so and how. But in particular, give us some sense of how you, and if you wish, how Facebook uh, is viewing the challenges, and you know, what do you think is your corporate responsibility and corporate imperative to deal with these challenges? Um. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it's, I just really appreciate hearing what other panelists are saying and the opportunity to be here because this is really meaty um, stuff to be grappling with. So um, I'm going to start just at a really quick high level and then drill into specifically some of the, the ways we're thinking about false news and misinformation just to kind of tackle that. And then there's tons of other, other issues to explore um, as well. But I'm on our content policy team at Facebook. And that's the team that writes our community standards. So those are the rules for what you can say and what you can't say on the, on the platform. Um, and from a, from a high level, the way we think about the principles behind our rules uh, are we want to be a platform for free expression where people with diverse perspectives can come and express themselves. We also want to be a place that is safe and respectful. Um, and I think that speaks to some of the tensions that Britton and um, Tim, Timothy already identified. Uh, and these have been principles that have been play, in play for years um, and why we have some limits on speech on the platform around hate speech and bullying um, and credible threats. Uh, and glad to speak to more of those in, in detail. I think in the last year, we have a new mission as a company um, to give people the power to build community and um, bringing the world closer together. And something that Mark Zuckerberg has spoken to, he wrote a community letter that some of you may have read earlier this year where he talked about the five pillars of how we're approaching that mission. The, the pillar I kind of want to focus on here is building an informed community because that speaks to sort of all of these questions about information in the digital age and how it's shared and how it's consumed. Um, we take this very seriously, we think we sort of we all have a responsibility to address uh, these issues of, of false news and misinformation, tech companies and media companies and classrooms. Um, we know people want to see accurate information on Facebook. We do as well. Um, and false news and hoaxes make the world less informed. So sort of counter to to a prong of our, of our mission. Um, we also have to be careful about how we approach this problem. You could imagine some hoaxes, as I'm sure you've seen, are really obvious. They're very easily debunked. This is sort of an example like the Pope is dead. We can quickly figure out that's not true. Um, but the line between hoax and satire and opinion can be blurry. And if you think about really hard cases of um, assessing the, the truth, um, like scientific claims. We could think about an article about climate change where someone's making a strong argument and some of their facts are supported by very robust research that everyone in, scientific, in the scientific community agrees with. But some of their facts are, are newer. Their methodology reflect method, methodologies that don't have as much socialization. And where would you draw the line in assessing the truth of those claims? Um, so our position to kind of Larry's framing has been that we should not be arbiters of the truth as Facebook. Um, and there's no silver bullet to kind of addressing these issues, but um, to continue the theme of lists, I'll give you four, four prongs of our approach as a company to how we're thinking about building a more informed community, um, kind of focusing on some of the product side uh, as well. So the, the first 
part of this that's extremely important is doing everything we can to ensure authentic activity on the platform. Um, we have policies against inauthentic accounts. People on Facebook must represent their real selves, use their real names, the names they use in their everyday life. Um, from a community standards perspective, so from where my team sits for, for a long time, we thought about this sort of accountability does increase the civility of speech um, and makes people more accountable for what they're saying. Um, in sort of the today's world, we also see that a lot of fake news is spread by fake accounts. Um, so authenticity is even, even more important today. Um, another prong of this approach to building an inf informed community is addressing the um, financial incentives to share false news, because we do see a lot of this content is financially motivated. So something we announced in the last year is um, giving less visibility to links shared on Facebook that direct you to what we call low quality web pages. So these are sort of web pages that are covered in ads that might be kind of shocking and sexually suggestive. Um, this may be common knowledge, but people make money by driving traffic to those landing pages because they get a percentage of that, that ad revenue whenever people see the ads. Um, so we're now making those, those links less visible because we've seen that as is a vector that overlaps with spreading fake news. Um, a third part of this is building new products to reduce and curb the spread of the false news in the, in the first place. Um, and in this way, because we ourselves have said we shouldn't be arbiters of the truth, we are working with independent third-party fact-checking partners. And this is something we're testing in four countries right now, so uh, the US, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Um, so when we get signals from our community and other signals that content might be a hoax, we can send this to these fact-checking partners. If they have debunked an article, many of them are already covering these stories and already doing the research to look into them. We can then um, feed that information back into the platform, so give that content less visibility on Facebook. And also, um, something again that we're, we've started doing is in a product we call Related Articles, showing both the original article that we sent to the fact-checkers and also the fact-checkers debunking article right below it. So that when you do see this, this news or content on, on Facebook, you also immediately have more information. You have access to that, that, um, that research. Um, and then the fourth thing I'll just quickly, quickly touch on is um, thinking about how we can give people more tools to see the complete picture. So not just hiding information or removing it from the internet, because a lot of this content remains on the internet, regardless of what, what Facebook does. Um, but show more complete information. So something else that we just are started testing and announced this week is a product experience called Article Context. Um, the way this works is if you see an article in your newsfeed um, for in this test, there are some articles with a little eye icon. You can click on that and immediately get more information about the publisher uh, from their Facebook page and also from Wikipedia and how that article is being shared on Facebook. And this is really a way to make it easier for people to quickly have access to some additional context, credibility cues um, about that content. Because we know people are reading and consuming information quickly in today's world. Um, and this is something we partnered on, the, we, whose development we partnered on with, um, with journalists um, and to kind of speak to some of the other questions raised. Uh, we launched an initiative earlier this year called the Facebook Journalism Project to really think about news literacy, partnerships with journalists, and how we can collaboratively build some new products um, to work together. And I will just say, if our School of Education colleague, Sam Weinberg, could be here today and he can't, um, he would say thank you for doing number four because his research has found that if you take a random sample of Stanford undergraduates, I will leave aside all the other young people in the world, they have a shocking inability to uh, distinguish uh, real from bad and deliberately false information on the net uh, at anything better than a level of randomness. And um, uh, we, we need better cues, and then we need to train users on how to use and seek out and recognize those cues. 
Okay, so um, I think if we could hear from other major private sector companies, we would hear that they as well are, are frankly, it's my impression, taking these challenges seriously, wrestling with them. I mean, they all feel, I think, uh, individually, a sense of responsibility and concern here, and obviously at a corporate level. Um, but, you know, publics and their elected representatives may or may not decide that that's good enough. So then the question is, uh, what is the role here of government to regulate this, and what are the dangers when government steps in? I know Frank is among those uh, on campus here and more broadly who um, are thinking about this. So Frank, uh, maybe you could begin to address that? Uh, sure. Uh, let me just say at the beginning, it's really great to have Eileen and Larry uh, running GDPI in uh, our center. and. Uh, we're really looking forward to a whole stream of activity in the coming years that uh, will build on this. So this is just the first little down payment. So, um, I, so I need to uphold the government part of the equation uh, a little bit uh, and just talk to um, different pr approaches cross-nationally to dealing with free speech and, and uh, this problem that's now uh, arisen with um, free speech on the internet. Uh, as you're probably aware, the United States is kind of a big outlier in its attitude towards free speech. Uh, most other democracies do not have our First Amendment and the body of law that stands uh, behind it. We take a much more absolutist view towards free speech, and so you're probably aware that in continental Europe, you know, uh, a lot of things, Holocaust denial, you know, hate speech, various forms of hate speech, have been criminalized, and this didn't begin with the internet. It, you know, these uh, rules have been in place uh, for a long time, uh, and they're much more willing to regulate uh, for, I think, a number of political culture reasons. The uh, thing that everybody is now uh, up in arms about, especially here, is this German, this new German Network Enforcement Act uh, that imposes extremely heavy penalties on fake news, uh, you know, it's called the Facebook law because it will severely restrict Facebook's ability to operate in that uh, country. Uh, and it's not something that any, I think, American lawmaker would ever, uh, would ever propose. Uh, now, I think that the American position is actually just another aspect of American exceptionalism. Larry and I were, um, uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Seymour Martin Lipset, you know, spent his whole career uh, explaining how the United States is actually a very unusual democracy. It's not just on free speech, but a whole range of issues involving the state or the government, uh, where the United States is really at the far end of a spectrum of behavior on the part of other liberal uh, democracies. So we have a much smaller welfare state. We never had a comprehensive you know, uh, health care system. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, we uh, do not have our government do that other uh, developed democracies are, are you know, uh, happy to actually regulate. Uh, the assumption that most Americans make is we're at the right end of the spectrum and all these other uh, countries are benighted, you know, they're over-regulating themselves, that's why their economies are not as vigorous uh, and so forth. Uh, but I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think that actually the right point to be uh, partly, you know, I mean, it's somewhere uh, probably closer to the American end than the European end, but I'm not convinced that actually the American end uh, is the uh, appropriate place, and a lot of that is simply determined by political culture. Now, if we go into the arguments for a kind of absolutist view of the, um, of the First Amendment, I think there are several different arguments, and I think all of them have limits. Uh, one of them, the, the classic defense of the First Amendment is the marketplace of ideas, that of course there's bad information, bad speech. Uh, in a democracy, everybody gets to have their say, and eventually the good information drives out the bad information, and you deliberate and you, you, know, you come to uh, uh, good conclusions. That's one area where I think technology has really uh, changed things, because if you have bots and these artificial uh, ways of uh, enhancing certain 
voices in that debate, uh, then it's not clear that the marketplace uh, uh, really works. Second um, argument has to do with slippery slopes, that if you, if you have any kind of restriction on, on speech, that creates a precedent for uh, increasing levels of, uh, of restriction, and before you know it, you're, you're in some kind of a you know, quasi-authoritarian situation. There, I would just say it's an empirical matter. I mean, European democracies have been able to restrict speech in these ways, and you know, they're still democracies. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like there's an inevitable <clears throat> escalation of the kinds of controls. And in fact, if you look at the behavior of governments, there's constantly a back and forth, because if you overregulate, that produces a feedback in a democratic society, and so you deregulate, and uh, so forth. There's third argument is just having has to do with an intrinsic right of free expression. Uh, the way we have this gets into these some of the themes of my identity book. But the way we interpret contemporary liberalism uh, is that you know everybody's got an intrinsic right to express who they are, even if that expression you know isn't pleasant or you know is is, is kind of strange uh, in you know, many ways that all of us have this um, inner being that, that, you know, needs to come out. Uh, and I think that this is one interpretation of free speech that's taken hold in uh, recent years. It's not the only one. And I think if you go back to the founding fathers and why they thought free speech is valuable, there are very specific reasons. Uh, they were political, that what you wanted to do was protect the ability of democracies to deliberate over political uh, matters. It wasn't an open-ended invitation to individual self-expression. Uh, it was a desire to have informed democratic uh, discourse. And you know, I mean, I think our society has shifted towards you know the the more expansive definition. But I do think you can make priorities in terms of uh, what um, uh, you know what the purpose of free speech is. I guess the final thing to say is that. A lot of this debate is simply shaped by attitudes towards the state and towards government. And uh, Americans, you know, one of the deepest traditions that are shared both on the left and the right in the United States is distrust of the state and the, you know, the, the fear that the state will eventually, you know, act in uh, ways that uh, unduly restrict uh, individual liberty. And not everybody feels that way. And so I think in Europe you have this long tradition. Uh, my favorite philosopher, Hegel, was really one of the big advocates of this that says, you know, the state is the embodiment of kind of impersonal public interest. Uh, and its job, it's got an important job in protecting uh, individuals from other powerful actors uh, out there uh, that could uh, harm, their, uh, harm their interests. Uh, and therefore, there's more of a social consensus in favor of uh, a certain kind of regulation. I'll give you one example of this, and it's funny that we don't talk about this in this kind of forum, public broadcasting, but this is a good example of it. So the Council on Europe mandates <clears throat> that every one of its members have a public broadcaster who is a government-sponsored, it's, it's a state broadcaster that is supposed to, in a kind of paternalistic way, give people good information. Uh, you know, this is ZDF in Germany, the BBC, NH. NH, I mean, Japan isn't part of the Council on Europe, but they've got NHK. So many other democracies have a state-owned broadcaster. And one of the ways that they counter fake news is to have a different narrative that these public broadcasters simply put out in front of people. So ZDF will give you a lot of you know, good information in the middle of reality TV programming because the state believes that German citizens need to have a certain you know, base baseline of knowledge of what's really uh, going on. Uh, and this can happen in Europe because in most European countries, people still trust their governments. You know, they don't think that their governments have been captured by, you know, by dangerous forces and that they do believe it represents a certain kind of impartial uh, public interest. In the United States, that's not possible. It's simply not possible because, you know, we try to have a public broadcasting system I think that it was always viewed, especially on the right, with a great deal of suspicion. And then that became sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where it actually did, I think, largely get captured by people more on the progressive side of the spectrum. And if you tried to establish a 
you know, what would be regarded as a neutral public broadcaster in the United States today, it's completely impossible <laughs> because the underlying polarization of the country would mean that we simply couldn't uh, agree. And so, you know, it, it's, so every country is going to be different in that regard, and that leads to my final conclusion, which is simply that um, in the United States, uh, I think state regulation is not possible. Anything that goes on is going to have to be uh, the product of some kind of private mm -hmm. self-regulation, as we just heard about uh, from Facebook. Uh, I think that when we think about this, it's my final point. Uh, I remember at one of these earlier conferences, somebody you know, at this suggestion said, what, you mean Mark Zuckerberg is supposed to decide you know, what's appropriate you know, for people on Facebook to hear? And so the answer to that, I think, is no. Of course, Mark Zuckerberg is not going to investigate all of the billions of postings on Facebook every day. But uh, I do think that already uh, the terms of service you know, has been an entry point for the curation of content, and you could move you know, the, the, the boundaries of that. Uh, and it's not impossible for a private organization to do this. Uh, we've got a number of private organizations that do this all the time. They're called media companies. Uh, the problem, however, is gets back to the first one that Tim started out with, which is the problem of scale. Facebook is just too damn big. I mean, it's, you know, the, you know, the New York Times can curate its content because there's Fox News and, you know, lots of other sources of mainstream uh, media and so its particular form of curation doesn't, you know, it, it's balanced by other uh, other sorts of things. But one of the problems with the platforms is, given how big they are, um, whatever decisions they make are going to have much much bigger effects uh, than you know any particular old mainstream media organization. So. Great. Um, so uh, we've gotten if you will, a big country perspective, <laughs> um, as well as a global one and a comparative one. I wonder if we could get a small country perspective now. And I'll, I'll just preface it by saying, I think until about 15 months ago, a lot of people probably thought, poor Latvia, so small, so close to Russia, so vulnerable to digital and non-digital subversion. I think we're a lot more humble now in the United States, but in any case, uh, Yeva, how have you viewed this from your perspective uh, in government, both in Latvia, in the Baltic states more generally, and as of course as part of the European Union and NATO? All right, thank you very much, and uh, thanks, Eileen, for inviting me. As, as it was mentioned, I am on leave. However, it's a temporary leave, so I have to admit that I'm still a government, in a government, and be, have to behave as a part of government. So right now I'm not speaking of, on behalf of my ministry, but okay. I do carry on a lot of experience. I just recently saw through that it's about 20 years serving the government and uh, done that in a very different, uh, challenging sort of environment, starting from NATO enlargement in, in 90s and uh, actually as, as uh, referring back to the point, and thanks to the great panelists, it's actually not much for me to add because a lot of really things uh, have been outlined. Uh, the way we see also, uh, we see and we have experience in Latvia, for example, re reinforcing the point that it's nothing new. If I look back in my own country, you know, living in bubbles was true even without social media. We, and we particularly have uh, Russian-speaking uh, large uh, society part. And uh, they do read only Russian uh, media. And uh, believe it or not, there can be a simple international event taking place in Riga, and you would read two articles, and you would not believe that it is the same, the same event. And uh, we actually did tackle that issue in the sense, uh, especially in the 90s, when we were very thoroughly scrutinized for you know, adhering to all democracy principles. We said uh, we will leave that to market uh, figure it out themselves. So we, as a government, didn't really interfere. I mean, there were Russian media, there were private business people who were sponsored from sources from Moscow or any other, and they, wrote, they were writing particular stories. And we let it say, you know, let them figure out. People live here and they will see. The truth is that 10, 15 years later, they are still living in a bubble and they might enjoy European values and freedom of travel and work and studies and all the benefits 
But if you ask political questions, they will think exactly what Moscow is thinking. So where the market uh, will sort of figure out the truth and uh, the right things, I'm, uh, I am a little bit cautious from our own experience. But that probably has to do with the fact that we are living in the front line and we're experiencing those threats more directly. So that was uh, one of the things. Uh, I also want to reinforce uh, what you mentioned about this uh, nothing new. Uh, I mean, it's only a technology. I think uh, uh, we had a recently conference in Riga discussing the same uh, issues, and then there's a nice word used, uh, the social media or technologies is an amplifier. Mm -hmm. It's basically it's the same thing. It's just uh, the volume on the reach out that they can amplify is incredible, and, and here, I can go back to the very basics before addressing very deep, deep issues. I, I think, why, why do we still struggle to get rid of bots and all those automatic tools? I mean, if, uh, if I reach, uh, uh, read a lot of uh, researchers who are able to trace down and say, you know, there are so many bots, so many tweets, or so many fake accounts on certain issues, I was thinking about why independent researchers get down to that and why can't we sort of struggle to get rid of it? Because I don't think it serves for the, for the good discourse or the quality debate if we are discussing between bots or fake accounts. And uh, I really don't know if, if we have to defend the freedom of speech of bot or, or, you know. So I think that's something I think some, there are difficult topics, but then I think there are some elementary things that require us to do a little better. And again, on fake, fake news or, or sort of amplifying it, uh, we, with the given concerns of security environment, uh, you probably have read that uh, NATO has put more troops uh, on the front line, including Baltic states and Poland. And so uh, our Stratcom Center in Riga did a research, a, short, a small research, just focusing on that NATO deployment and how that is mm -hmm. being pub published on social media. And so what they learned is that in Russian language, it was about 80% tweets generated by bot, and obviously anti-NATO and all kind of false information. So it's 80% of information gets, gets uh, generated by robots and has nothing to do I mean, this, uh, the, the, the amount for English language was less, but still quite substantial, 48%. So it's a big, I think it's a big impact that we should somehow try to uh, eliminate. That's, uh, that's uh, one uh, additional. So thinking about what can governments do, and, and, um, and I think governments have to do, at least I feel as a, Democrat, as a part of democratically elected government, I feel we are responsible towards society. We are responsible when we see that society is under threat. And not only we feel responsible, when I was head of cybersecurity, I got all kind of different strange requests forwarded from you know, private sector, from newspapers, from individuals, where people could not figure out, we, we see things are not right, and they turn to government because they don't know what, how to handle it. Like, you know, anonymous threats on the internet, or you know, contents, or for example, Latvia created Ask FM. There was a portal, and we got a lot of requests because at some point uh, the suicide rate increased because of, I mean, not that I felt a government is responsible, but there is a moment when our societies are threatened by internal or external uh, forces, and uh, it certainly puts me in positions that I think we do have to react. And uh, of course, there's no golden sort of one, one way how to resolve, but I think it's a mix of tools, and, uh, and here I would agree with, with, with Fukuyama, Mr. Fukuyama that uh, regulations is part, but that's maybe from where I come and from our traditional culture. I think uh, uh, it's not going to be easy, and especially if you think about EU, where we have set and tried to figure out cybersecurity regulation, first one, it's, it's very hard to regulate something across the border. I think we will make mistakes, but I think we, that's something where we can self-correct. If we get regulations not working or not working properly, we can evaluate that, we can change that. But uh, I think we all wake up in the morning with tons of priorities. The speed of our daily lives are so, so intense 
that sometimes we need sort of rules or some sets that kind of reminds it that these things also need to be done, that it's not all money driven. You know, it's, I, I think we all wake up in the morning with tons of priorities and you know, sometimes regulations just enforce certain things that you kind of have intention to deliver but somehow didn't get to, the, to your list of priorities down there because it's not, I mean, it's your good intention but then you have some, some, so many others. Um, I think, but that's, that's only one part that I think uh, have to be explored. And like you said, there are cases already in Europe there where it has been applied. Uh, I also struggle with, so, and then the second part would be, what is that that we do ourselves about reaching out people, society? And of course, the government has always been handicapped in any new environments. We are the last ones who catch up with what's been going on in, you know, business sectors and private and, uh, uh, and I think we are trying to do that. We are learning, you know, how to deal, how to operate in digital digital world. And uh, that particular was the reason why a stratcom of NATO was created, because also NATO was failing, as a felt like failing uh, as alliance uh, addressing its outreach, and in particular while it was in uh, actively in Afghanistan. But uh, another aspect what I wanted to mention, not only is that the, the social media is about volumes, but what I have been reminded in a very many discussions, it's not about facts, it's about feelings. And so in somewhere I agree because people say, you know, and governments are really bad about writing good stories. It's, you know, if you think about press statements, they are not the most retweeted things that government or press release that government writes. But not, it's not only about government, it's in general. It's uh, very difficult to counter, counter emotions and facts. The things that go viral are emotions. And even if it involves some wrong factual aspects, if you counter that saying, you know, right, facts are this or that, it doesn't really bounce. And so how do you operate, uh, counter operate, or how do you provide this alternative when it's dominated by emotions? I don't know if you remember there was this case, I think in South Korea, the researcher who commented something, what it was, BBC, and he had the kids in front, run, uh, in the background, and, and who remembers what were the facts he said, but it <laughs> went viral because it was emotional. And so, so, many, so are many other things. So I know that in Europe, now we have a hybrid uh, center also in Finland opening, thinking about how we, how we tackle new information societies. But I really, I think that's for me a question, how do we reach out when it's not about facts, but it's about emotions. So um, okay. I think, yeah, I guess in a, in a if I look. We should probably move yeah. on so that. So that's um, cool, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Eva. Um, I want to now uh, turn finally back to Tim. I know he uh, wanted to come in on this question of, so what do we do, particularly in terms of government regulation or not? Uh, and so, Tim, if you could just share your thoughts, and then we'll open it up to um, uh, everyone in the audience. Thank you, Larry. Well, I'm sure we want to let the people speak, so I'll, I'll try and be very brief. But uh, I want to take off from where Frank um, um, left it. Uh, I mean, in the world of states, it seems to me there are essentially three global, big global norm setters, China, Europe, and the United States. China, joined by Russia and Iran, with its model of information sovereignty, political control, censorship, disinformation, is getting more and more traction in many different ways. Many people in this room are working on that. In that context, it is extremely worrying that Europe and the United States, the two halves of what we used to call the West, remember, remember the West, um, <laughs> are, 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 are seriously diverging. Now, in some respects, Europe is actually doing better. Public service broadcasting in these circumstances is more important than ever, as Frank said. Antitrust, we should have been on it long ago. It's a big issue, right? I mean, I would argue to pick up the marketplace of ideas that we're seeing what I would call a market failure in the marketplace of ideas. So there's a case to put the market back. But the model of content regulation represented by the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, uh, more popularly known as the German Facebook law, is extremely worrying. Not just because of the degree of state intervention in legitimate political speech, but also because it is incentivizing the platforms 
to do massively overtake down because the way it's set up, they have to decide what is illegal according to German law and the German Justice Ministry comes along afterwards like your professor and says uh, you got it right or you got it wrong and if you got it wrong you get fined 50 million euros a smack. 50,000? Million? Million, million, yeah. So even for Facebook that will gradually add up. So that incentivizes you to take down. Now my point is this, and this goes back to a lot of what other people have said. If we who believe in both free speech and democracy are to argue against this dangerous development in Europe, and by the way, as Germany goes, the EU is quite likely to go in this as in other things, we have to have a much more credible story of what is actually being done about it by our governments, by civil society, but crucially by the platforms, and above all, frankly, by one platform, Facebook. This is in the first place. What Facebook does in the next two years is much more important than anything the US government does in this respect. Facebook is a privately owned global public sphere. And, and so in a way, that's I think what the rest of the conversation should almost be about, is what should Facebook do? Pick up a couple of points. Number one, I think your little eye icon is a very, very good way to go. I call it food labeling for content because it enables you to empower democratic discourse and critical thinking without taking the stuff down. Um, real name policy, and I'd like to come back to you on this, it's very good for us in established democracies, but in countries where I and Larry spend a lot of our time in dictatorships, anonymity is essential for dissidents. It's the difference between being in prison and not. The Electronic Frontier Foundation put a proposal to Facebook some years ago, which I think was very good, which was, you can be anonymous or pseudonymous so long as we, Facebook, in a secure form, know your true identity. So if you're a dissident in China or Russia or a woman in an oppressive uh, religious community, you get that message to Facebook, they have, they know you're a real person, not a bot, but then you have a pseudonymous account. Why not do that? That's the kind of thing I think we should think about. Above all, I would say there's a meta thing that Facebook and the other platforms have to do fast, which is transparency. If we are to have an informed public debate about what Facebook should do, we have to start by knowing more about what Facebook does do. And I think you really need to step up to the plate very fast on that. A colleague of mine calls it procedural accountability. So, um, so that, I think, I think the buck now is not stopping on the desk of President Donald Trump. Thank heaven, it's <laughs> stopping on the desk of Mark Zuckerberg. Do you want to, before I go to the sure. audience... Uh, Very the quickly, um, because those are really fantastic questions and I agree that, um, you know, for example, on transparency, it is incredibly important um, and something we think a lot about. Um, and again, to kind of speak to, I guess, I'll touch on transparency and sort of the government relations regulations question quickly. Um, on transparency, for our community standards, we publish those externally. We do want people to know what our policies are. We um, also have started doing something in the last year where we've launched a hard questions blog to really bring more people into some of our decisions around hate speech and terrorism and how we approach these, these issues. Um, and, and even at a more granular level, thinking about how we can give people more information when we do remove content from the site. So we're not just saying something you posted violated our community standards, we're saying the specific policy that was violated. Um, and when we develop policy, uh, something I think it's really important for us to communicate out is the, the various stakeholders we engage with. So talking to academics, talking to governments, talking to safety orgs, um, and, and other NGOs, and really you know, consulting with the people who are on the front lines of these trends to help inform our policy development, especially because language changes, behaviors change, um, so those conversations are extremely important. On um, sort of the, the government regulation question, something we talk about is Facebook is a borderless product, and that means people around the world are talking to each other across national borders on the platform. 
Um, and so one real challenge is if, if laws start to be in conflict, that will inevitably impact kind of the quality of, of people's conversations. Great. Um, now we will uh, come to you, uh, beginning with President Elvis, before, if someone could hand him the mic. Before we do, I do want to recognize all of the people who've joined our live stream uh, as long probably as an hour and a half ago. We know you're there. We appreciate your being with us. If you're in Asia and it's the middle of the night, we really appreciate it. Uh, and um, uh, we hope you'll be able to transmit your, um, your thoughts over the course of the day to us. So, Thomas, over to you. I just throw this out. I mean, I think this discussion and most of the discussion uh, has, for a year almost, has been about content, uh, directly about fake news and so forth. In fact, I was one of the first persons who actually wrote about fake news having a different role uh, in a digital age about a year ago. Um, I think we're put, uh, and I think, I mean, the German response, again, is to fake news. The real, pr the problem, uh, has, as has become clear over in the summer, is, uh, is much different, which is not necessarily the fake news, but how you get ads that are the, the so-called dark ads, which unfortunately Facebook refuses to make public, that uh, Facebook has not followed the recommendations of the Federal Election Commission, that uh, it say who is paying for the ads, which is something that is the case with uh, mass, I mean, with television, radio, and so forth. Uh, a big, big question is how these ads are targeted and what kind of information is going, has been, is being sold about, uh, so that would enable uh, social media to target certain people based on the b um, big data analysis of who they are, where they're from, what their income is, what their race is, and so forth. I mean, these are issues which are, ver uh, to me, can be ver are very dark, and that we, if we just look at what the message is, okay, I mean, there's, there are enough problems with that, but how you end up being targeted uh, how your personal data are being used to to uh, to f single you out algorithmically is an issue that is only beginning to be touched upon and I think uh, I have a gut feeling it's a bigger can of worms than we want to do or look I mean than we realize at this point uh, and certainly some of the revelations of what Cambridge Analytica did working together with Facebook uh, during the election in the United States um, when we look at uh, the kind of, we don't know enough about the targeting in the French election yet because I don't think it's been, well, I, maybe I don't follow it as much. But, or any of them. Well, but the point is that there are, there are things going on either algorithmically or non-algorithmically behind the scenes that we know very little about and that is not being made public and I worry a lot about that. I'm going to ask our panelists to just take notes. I'm going to give them a chance to respond in a few minutes. And I should have said, please introduce yourself, but that was the former president of Estonia and distinguished visiting scholar here at FSI in Hoover, Thomas Ilves. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Radhika? I'm Radhika Shah. I'm co-president of a thousand member Tech Innovation Club at Stanford called Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, as well as an advisor to the Sustainable Development Goals Philanthropy Platform. My question, uh, one to the big cats, um, to like, the representatives there, but also a general question. Is this a moment in time with the crisis that all world leaders have recognized in ratifying the SDGs and the governance problems across the world? Is this a moment why, and the technology issues that the big cats actually need to go beyond being reactive. I, I find that your company, others are extremely reactive whenever I report a crisis. For example, poaching has gone through the roof because people can anonymously trade. And whenever I report such things, there's always a very proactive, reactive response. Is it a moment when com big cats who are in the tech industry, in the social media, need to go beyond reactive and take responsibility for proactively identifying the issues that tech is creating, because you're in a better position than government and many other leaders. And second, 
could you be the ones who bring in other companies, kind of create a movement to bring a change in this area and inform policy a lot more tightly than is happening right now, and so that we can scale on policy. The second question for the big dogs and uh, mice is that, um, is, is it a moment in time to look at the freedom of speech the way we have it? Is it a moment to amend the Constitution for responsible free speech because of the xenophobia that's exploding across the country, even in places like Silicon Valley? And is there a role for tech to solve this problem? Don't talk about amending the First Amendment. You're not going to like the result. Uh, Marcos, and then over to Mike. We only have time for probably two or three more questions, so keep them very brief. <clears throat> so this is, I'm Marcos Kunalakis. I'm with the Hoover Institution, and I look at media and foreign policy, and I also used to work at ZDF, at Zweite Deutsches Fernsehen. But my question is uh, really specific to three uh, qualities of the new information uh, environment. And they really are the, the challenges of uh, velocity, which has increased the uh, question of volume, and then finally, the question of veracity. And it seems that in other aspects of our democratic system, we have uh, structures that deal with these three things. And I'll just use two examples. One is, as television broadcast uh, began, we used to, uh, we still have what's called a, uh, a, um, a buffer between what's going out live and the amount of time that you actually see it. So there's a five seconds or three seconds, depending on the broadcast, so that there's ability to break it off. The second is in the stock market, when things, when velocity of trading and when the veracity of the, issue, of the information changes and the volume is so great, we actually have circuit breakers and they trigger in at various uh, levels of, of the velocity and of the volume of trading. And so is this something we can look at in some non-regulatory fashion where there's actually a, the ability for government and the platforms to work together to try and build in some of these circuit breaking uh, aspects that exist elsewhere? Okay, uh, Mike. So Mike McFall, Stanford, just two questions that are bouncing around that I want people to drill down on. And, and Nick, I, wanna, I want you to join with Facebook, uh, if it's okay, if we can. Nick from Twitter, Larry, uh, it may, yeah, yeah. on this question, okay? So two, on, first on the paid versus non-paid, and your example of food, uh, Tim, um, I, I would just remind you that that didn't happen until there was regulation, right? Um, and the same with uh, political advertising. It was only, at least in this country, I don't know the other countries, it didn't happen without the state getting involved. Uh, so wrestle with that. Tell me, you know, why should we believe that Facebook or Twitter or Google, let's please not keep forgetting Google. They <laughs> like the fact that we are, but there is this thing called YouTube that is really important to this conversation. Uh, they're, they're grateful that they're not here, but we should remind ourselves. They, they are, oh, they're they here, are, but, they but they are very much here. I'll be glad to <laughs> Don't introduce get me wrong. you just, to Justin. I, I, I understand, but just uh, we, we tend Jennifer, to forget. We, think we, we, we use the verb tweet a lot more than we do. Anyway, never mind. I'm wasting time on that. For, that's number one. <laughs> Two, Tim and, and others on this anonymous thing. I, I wish, I mean, you gave one example of a solution. Uh, I, I, could our other panelists and, and, and the platforms as well, because on all norms, there's a trade off between the ultimate good and what is necessary for other uh, norms. I think on this norm, the, the notion that there are these anonymous people in countries I know well too, by the way, that need this uh, benefit, uh, that is always used to, to, to justify giving free speech to bots. So help us under, there, there, there seems to me that there are both technical solutions that I know are being worked on, but maybe some third party solutions not unlike the one you use. Mm -hmm. This seems to me like a solvable problem that we do not have to just stand behind this this uh, universal idea that we have to protect human rights activists in Belarus and Uzbekistan, it reminds me a little bit of our debate we have about gun control. I, uh, struggle with it in a policy way a little bit deeper if you could. Uh, everybody. Uh, Nick, you're on the concluding panel, but do you feel the need to say anything now before we take the last two questions? Hi, Nick Pickles from Twitter. Um, this is the second time I've come to Stanford and had a question from the floor, so thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, um, no, I, I think that the point about food regulation is often there's a difference between minimum standards and then what, how industry applies it differently. And so I think there is things that industry can do that go far beyond um, what might be a regulatory standard. 
one of the big challenges of regulatory standards is not just writing them for two or three big companies and how they apply across an ecosystem, which is whether it's the programmatic ad market and the pipes in the middle, whether it's smaller platforms, um, is a big challenge. Uh, and I also think that particularly where things like elections are so um, central, there is a really important role of kind of the political kind of culture in a country coming together and deciding the rules that they want for their democracy. Because different countries will have different views about money, donations. Uh, you know, the UK doesn't allow paid TV ads, for example. Um, I was also just trying to find some data from a government study uh, in a, um, I can't remember which country, where they did have a real name uh, legislation and they scrapped it because it didn't work. So I think certainly from our point of view, and the one thing I would say on the, um, the idea of companies having some kind of repository, secure repository for identities of people, is that um, I, I was fortunate enough to meet some of the people who worked on the um, Racker is being sorted silently project. And, and we're very proud at Twitter that, that we don't have that process. They can use their, uh, their pseudonym. Uh, they don't have to give us personal information. They were still tracked down. And several of them were stabbed in mm. hotel rooms in Turkey mm. in their 20s. So I think that process is the idea of it's possible to come up with that kind of secure model. And I think your point about surveillance there, Tim, is very important. Uh, I'm, I think we're still a long way away from that. Right. OK, I'm going to take the two of you. Uh, but please be very brief. We're, we're actually over time. Go ahead. Um, I, Joanne Lulin, um, political activist. Um, I wanted to ask Facebook, one of the things that concerns me is the, someone hiring people like Campbell Brown uh, that is a liaison to all the major newspaper or uh, you know mainstream media, and she's extreme right wing. And I find it very interesting that that's who Facebook did, which makes me feel like Facebook isn't really interested in, in dealing with fake news. Okay, go ahead. Um, yes, so um, my name is Jackie Kerr. I'm a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore National Lab at the Center for Global Security Research, and I'm a, um, an affiliate at CSAC here. Um, and I work on issues related to cybersecurity and uh, internet policy, especially in authoritarian states. Um, one of the things that's concerned me, coming back from doing research in places like Kazakhstan and Russia on internet policy and the roles of companies and the government pressure on companies, is seeing the dramatic about face in public uh, pressure on companies in the last year. And even though studying Russia, I'm perfectly aware that there is a there there in, in the concern about fake news and information campaigns on the one hand, and I've sometimes been a little bit critical of the uh, extreme free expression position on issues like defining hate speech as hate against an individual uh, as opposed to hate against a whole religion uh, with the um, Innocence of Muslims film, for example, justification. On the other hand, it seems like there's a democracy deficit in what's going on, and it's reactive, that you have pressure on companies coming from both media and government to respond to security concerns, whatever's the hot button concern of the moment, and one week week after another, there are new announcements of algorithmic changes and policy changes happening behind closed doors uh, through uh, decision-making processes between uh, the tech community and legal experts and government experts. Um, I wonder what role the mice can play in this and uh, what role you can, what, what you can do as a process that engages more public discourse in what is really redefining the limits of free expression in uh, the public sphere, in our democracy, especially when it involves things that are so complex complex, like AI algorithms. Thanks. Well, Justine, I'm sorry that you have had to bear the full uh, measure of responsibility for the entire private sector here. <laughs> but uh, since for this panel, in effect, you do, we'll start with you and then finish with the rest of the panel. OK. How much time <laughs> why should I aim uh, for? If you could do it in three minutes, that would be good. But okay. let's see how it goes. Not more, not too much more than that. We're really okay. kind of pressed. Sure. But do um, your best. Thank you so much for the questions. And I'm really glad to talk to people afterwards if you want to come up to me um, to kind of drill in on some of the specific things you raised, because I probably won't address them all. Um, let's see, what's most important to, to highlight here? I guess just sort of going chronologically. Um, on the question of ads transparency, um, we absolutely take our work on election integrity very seriously. There's been a lot of public announcements from our leadership in the last month um, talking about some of the things we are, we're committed to doing um, on our end. Um, so just to highlight a couple of those for, for this group, um, one is making ads more transparent. For example, if you see an ad on Facebook 
make it possible for you to see the page running that ad and the other ads that page is also behind. Uh, so you have more information. Um, two is strengthening our ad review process, which involves both people and um, automated systems. Um, another is tightening some of our restrictions on ad content. So our ad policies are actually stricter than our community standards today because these are this is content we're pushing to people that they might not be connected to through friends or pages they followed. Um, and one, one thing we've talked about is, is looking at subtle expressions of violence in, in ads. Um, and then just to kind of tie back to a theme, a last thing on that front is, is looking at authenticity in ads. Um, and something we've talked about is applying some of our technology or improving the way we apply our technology for identifying fake accounts to the page level um, and advertisers. Um, that's a very short answer to a, a very big question. Um, on the question of, you just stop me when I should wrap Keep up. Keep going. Um, on the question of sort of being reactive in volume, which I'm going to lump together, um, we do rely on our community to report content to us that might violate our policies and then review that. Something we are also doing increasingly and have been doing is thinking about how we can use AI and technology to help that process. So not only using technology to get um, the right content in front of the right people, so people with the right language expertise, um, but also in the space of, of terrorism, for example, using image matching technology so that we can more quickly identify and stop the spread of, of terrorist content on the platform. But people remain really key to this process um, for many reasons. One is that context matters when you're looking at whether content does or doesn't violate. Um, our policies, our community standards. Uh, so an example is for hate speech, we don't allow people to use slurs to attack others. That's a line for us. But we do let people use slurs self-referentially. So if we see a slur like the word dyke uh, with no other context, you really have to look at clues and sort of understand how that term is being used. If it's being used to refer to yourself, that's okay. If it's being used to attack someone, it's not. Um, so people are really key to that process. Um, Give me one more point. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I guess just to the point about sort of um, uh, working with, with news media, I would sort of just emphasize the point I made earlier of many, many people at Facebook are engaged with, with different groups and orgs. Um, something we're also talking a lot about is local news. Uh, and how can we, both in, in terms of civic engagement and helping people engage at the local level with their representatives, how can we work with local news orgs um, on the platform? Okay, then let's just start from beginning to end uh, on this side, okay. beginning with Frank. Anything else? Yeva? No, I think not much to add. I think it was a very rich discussion. And on, I think on regulations, uh, I think one maybe point is that it, I would like to see that Sort of, as it was emphasized here, there is a West that we would try to, even if we have a different cultures. I mean, we still stand by the same values, and you know, more are we divided, even on freedom of speech, more for sure the other side or whoever, for whatever uh, reasons, will make use of that. So I think it's uh, even if we find different ways of how to resolve, we should still kind of support and work hand in hand. I mean, across the ocean, or even if we not speak only Europe, U.S., but like. Japan and other countries that are democracies, we should find how to address, even if we find a different regulation or self-imposed uh, sort of uh, transparency or other uh, ways that we should try, try to st stay together because our, our difference is being for sure made use, useful. That, that is a really important point. Thank you. Okay, Britain? All right, I'll, I'll be brief so we can all have our lunch. Um, I'm starting to wonder if the, um, if the global public policy sphere is about to strike back. Mm -hmm. um, namely, can you put the toothpaste back in the tube after the German Facebook law? If you look globally, you'll see versions of this very lightly modified being introduced in other governments around the world, in Israel, in other EU countries, and perhaps, most upsettingly, in the Duma in Russia. So um, the, the activist groups that I encounter around the world 
talk about the, uh, th these laws are born of frustrations from the, exactly. of frustration mm -hmm. from the companies not being seen to self-regulate. So um, another overarching question that we don't have time to answer right now is if companies do self-regulate, where is the appropriate forum for this to take place? And by this I mean the internet is, is not flat. The internet has underlying layers of architecture. Is it the registrars? Is it the content providers? Where do you look and where do you place that pressure on regulation? Because that will have substantial implications for freedom of expression and how people are able to communicate with each other online. Um, uh, fast forward. The, the pace of innovation for technological solutions related to democracy promotion is not good. And I think that is something that needs to be said quite plainly. Um, if, you, if you look at Google's perspective AI, for example, they were measuring toxicity. And that's, are you being, are you being pushed away from a conversation online based on the negative content therein? Um, this measure is not exactly what people who are looking at democracy promotion may focus on if they are being subjected to hate speech. They might want to see, why don't you measure hate speech? The real answer is this is very, very dif difficult and contextual. And the AI processes that people think can filter this out aren't at the point yet where they can take context into account or shadings that, that are necessary for nuanced political debate. Finally, I, I, I would like to emphasize that anonymity online is not the sibboleth that, that many people think it is. When, when you look at um, the recent research, coming out of MIT, they, they say that um, social, the social environment and counter speech actually have bigger impacts on um, the health and accepting the nature of a social environment more so than the presence of anonymous speech. So my concluding thought is maybe we are looking at technological problems, but these have social or political solutions. Okay, we opened with you, Tim. I am delighted that you're gonna have the last word too. Very briefly, I couldn't agree more with your comment that the platforms need to get much more proactive. Facebook in particular has been very reactive. Four thoughts on this, number one, and this goes to Thomas Ilves's point, procedural accountability. That is to say, we need to know what procedures are followed by Facebook, for example, with targeted advertising, right? That's the first step before knowing that Russian agents, in a loose sense, have been actually targeting uh, American voters. And that would apply, I think, across the board. <coughs> we have an overall picture of the procedures. Number two, I think food labeling for content is a really great way to go, and I think there's a lot of mileage in that. I like Mike's point that, that you know, government initiated that. In a sense, Mike, government has initiated it. It's just it's foreign governments coming up with the wrong answers, but that's still, the pressure is still there. Number three, I think we need a very serious discussion about whether in Facebook newsfeed there is not an area of, in the broader sense, political information. That information we need to be an informed citizenry practicing democratic self-government, which should be in some sense treated differently from the pictures of your pussycats. <laughs> um, and, and this goes to the algorithm and to Marcos's three Vs. Don't we need the algorithm in that area to start thinking a bit more about veracity as against virality? Number four, um, Mike, your excellent point on what do we do about anonymity? I totally agree with it, uh, with you. You know, I think this is solvable. And if I may suggest a, a workshop at Stanford with Facebook, starting from the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, suggestion, which I think was a very sensible one, would be a good way to go. And I look forward to Stanford coming up with the answer. <laughs>